The Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. EliteForm.com, IgnitionAPG.com, PlayUSA at PLAEUSA.com, and Soranex Exercise Equipment at Soranex.com. And now, the Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast. Welcome to Iron Game Chalk Talk with your host, Ron McKeever. Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! Everything you got! On this podcast, hear Coach McKeever's straight talk about training, featuring the top strength and conditioning professionals from around the world. And now, here's your host, Ron McKeever. Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefrey, and this is episode number 136, the last episode of 2015. And I want to be the first to wish you guys the very best 2016. Uh, can't tell you how much I appreciate you guys following the show and being uh, loyal listeners and, and just contributing to my own personal development. That's why I, uh, that's why I started the show, is just to to really continue to develop myself and, and get outside my box and, and talk to strength coaches from around the world. But um, but enjoyed going on this process, this journey with each and every one of you. So, so thanks so much for that. Uh, I have a ton of great things planned for 2016 and uh, I'm super excited about that as well. Today, I have Mitch also with us. Mitch is a buddy of mine. He is the Prevention, Rehab, and Physical Performance Coordinator at Missouri State. Uh, just a fantastic purpose, a person. And this, this episode every year is my favorite episode. And what I try to do uh, with the last episode of the year is really just highlight uh, an organization, a person, uh, you know, some great uh, cause that's going on in the world. And, you know, Mitch is a great, a great strength coach and, and athletic trainer. Um, and we'll, we'll, when we get into in this episode about kind of the sports medicine strength conditioning relationship and how he's been able to blend the two at Missouri State, but more importantly, uh, he has an organization that he co- uh, co-founded called Man Up and Go. And you know, there's certain people in this world that you identify with, and and Mitch and I clicked really, really quick. Um, you know, through our faith, through um, adoption, we talk about that. He's adopted, just adopted his fourth child. Uh, just like us, we have four adopted children as well, and uh, and then just you know how he's been able to to build this this organization, man up and go, and and they started this basically as uh, you know a uh, missions trip, uh, you know through I think Uganda, but maybe Ethiopia, I can't remember exactly which, but um, but basically through that process they learned uh, through these orphans around the world that you know just. They're, they're fatherless. You know, they just don't have a, a great, strong male role model in their lives. And so 28 of them, uh, 28 men went to, I believe, Uganda and, uh, and started a, uh, an annual trip that they go on now, uh, just basically uh, showing love and compassion for these, for these orphans around the world and, and, uh, and co- simultaneously uh, developing these men that go on this trip to to man up, you know, just to be f- phenomenal male role models in this world. And as most of our strength coaches are, are, are men that listen to this, but it's applicable to anybody, you know, the, the opportunity we have to impact this world each and every day with the athletes that we touch um, and the example that we set is critical. And so, um, you know, I'd encourage you to go up to man and go, manupandgo.com uh, they have a blog site as well, but there's lots of ways you can get involved with this. I mean, there's they have mission teams, uh, they have a domestic element as well. Um, you know, they have gear that you can purchase that helps fiscally re- uh, help them, or you can just donate. And you know, one of the things that I, you know, I get lots of emails and lots of calls, and and you know, whenever I interact with people at conferences and stuff, and they always ask, you know, how they can support either me or the show or or whatever. And, and I, I don't do this to, to, to make a ton of money. I There is a little bit of money that I make. Uh, I want to be completely transparent with that. But I do this because I, I care about the profession and I care about coaches. And the one thing I would ask is that, you know, uh, when I identify causes like this, uh, organizations like this, if you could donate anything, 
Um, anything helps, but I mean, there's over 6,000 coaches that listen to this, this podcast each and every week. And, and, and if everybody just donated a dollar, $6,000 for an organization like this goes so far. And, um, and so I would encourage you, I would challenge you not just to listen to this and, and think about it and say, that would be nice, but to just pause the podcast, go and actually donate uh, a buck or five bucks or 10 bucks, whatever you can, um, to an organization like this and what Mitch has got going on. And, and, um, I, I tell you what, I mean, giving, um, is so rewarding in so many different ways, but to help support a fellow strength coach that's making an impact in this world, uh, is awesome. And so, uh, can't say enough about this. I mean, I think one thing that I always talk about with our players is that we have to become, uh, you know, they have to become better fathers and better husbands and better citizens and, what better way to demonstrate that by supporting causes like this that are making a direct contribution? And I, I can tell you from personal experience, um, unless you've ever been in another country or you've been around orphans, that all they want is a family that loves them. Uh, it, it is so impactful in so many different ways. Uh, one of the three times in my adult life that I've cried is, is you know, leaving the orphanage and having a hundred plus people, uh, you know, kids tugging at your shirt saying mama and papa and wanting you to go take them with them with, uh, with you. And so, um, what a great cause. And so, uh, we talk about the cause, we talk about, you know, uh, lots of different things in this episode. I know you're going to get a ton out of it before we do. We want to make sure we recognize our sponsor for this episode, elite form. Uh, if you have not followed them on Twitter, I would encourage you to go to at elite underscore form. And follow them. They put out some great information. Um, and velocity-based training is right now is just becoming such a, 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 a an integral part of the programming standpoint. And you know, it's not you know with, with a lot of the work that Dr. Brian Mann at Missouri is doing, and and some other coaches around the world. It's probably going to get to a point where we're using velocity-based zones as opposed to percentages, and and uh, really some awesome. Um, work that that's being done uh, on our behalf and and uh, some great research and so i'd encourage you to follow elite form as i mentioned i have lots of things going on uh in 2016 one of which is going to be starting a new podcast called ask coach mac um in an effort just to kind of minimize the number of um emails i get questions i get uh and and responding to those um you know all the time, you know, uh, repeatedly. And so uh, I thought putting out a podcast, it would be a five to seven minute podcast where I just answer questions from you guys, uh, getting, trying to find ways to serve uh, our community better. But the way to do that right now is to go to my website, robmckeefer.com and just click the send voicemail on the right hand side there. And, uh, and, and send me a voicemail with your question, introduce yourself, uh, where you're from, ask the question, and I'll use that audio in my response uh, through the podcast. Can't answer every question, but I'm going to do my best to answer common questions and uh, make sure that I, I help you out or help out um, the community by uh, answering those those most commonly asked questions. And so um, that if there's things that uh, you feel that I can help um, you or the community with as well. I'm always looking for ways to serve uh, our profession better. And so I would encourage you to send me an email or send me a voicemail and just let me know uh, what are your biggest challenges right now? What are your biggest pain points and, and, and how I could potentially help with that? You know, that's, that's really one of my big goals for 2016 is just finding a way to help out more. And so Kind of long-winded intro, but I wanted to, to, to really highlight Mitch and his organization. I'm going to link up all the different ways that you can support them and follow them. But uh, what a great cause. What a great organization. Doing some awesome work in this in this world. And uh, and like I said, supporting Elite Forum and the rest of our sponsors uh, just continues to help me do uh, serve the community as much as I can and, and on into 2016. So... Sit back, enjoy this episode, and I'll see you on the other side. All right, guys. Hey, welcome back. We've got a treat for you today. We're really excited to have a buddy, Mitch, on the on the line with us. And um, Mitch and I go back a few years. We spoke at a couple conferences together. 
Um, but there's rarely, you know, there's there's lots of times through through your career you'll come across people that kind of match you in um, in all the areas that 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 are important to you. And so, first, he's a man of faith. Second, he's um, doing great in the world. He's got a foundation, uh, man up and go. That we'll talk about great strength coach and and, and sports medicine professional, and um, you know, just does it the right way. You know, and so we we instantly. Uh, hit it off, man, and and you know when when uh, when you sit back and you're looking around the, uh, around the profession, you find guys that you gravitate towards, and you find people that uh, that you respect, and you look up to, man, and you're one of those guys. So I appreciate you coming on, man. I appreciate it, coach. So thanks for having me. Definitely, thanks for the kind words. I don't know that they're uh, warranted, but uh, but I'll take them nonetheless. No, 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 not at all. But hey, let's let's get into it, man. Why why did you get in? I mean, we we talked a little bit off camera about you know, hey, there was a, there was a spot about how I could be involved with kind of college athletics, and and you did it in a way that was unique, in that you kind of had a dual passion. You had a kind of passion of strength and conditioning and passion for for sports medicine. So kind of talk about what got you into the field, and then kind of the road that you've taken to be there at Missouri State? Well, definitely. I, um, I got into it. Uh, I love college athletics. Played college football at University of South Dakota. Uh, really considered going into coaching. Um, but, uh, of course, as I'm going through, like a lot of us as college football, pl- football players, looking at my uh, assistant coaches every night, you know, every day, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., watching film, doing the whole deal. And, and I knew I wanted a family, and uh, I knew I wanted some stability. And so I started looking at this idea of, of you know, sports medicine, athletic training, uh, maybe strength conditioning. I'd been injured a fair amount in my college career. So I started to learn more about it. It became attractive to me because I just felt like, hey, here's a great way I can stay around college athletics but uh, also hopefully have some continuity and uh, be able to have a little bit of a home life and, and a family life. And, and so that was really my goal. Um, as you and I talk, college athletics has changed a little bit where it's not as stable as it used to be. Um, and, and there's some goods and bads to that. And, and, uh, um, but that was really what kind of led me into it. And because I was a, a, you know, had a passion for strength and conditioning as a player. I loved to lift. I loved to work out. I loved to, um, back in my high school days, I mean, just 6 a.m. every day in the weight room. And, and so really gravitated more to the strength and conditioning side. Um, but uh, just through my educational process at USD, uh, also sat for my boards to, to be, be a certified athletic trainer. And uh, so I came out with that ATC background as well, really have always described myself as a strength coach who happens to be an athletic trainer. So um, currently I'm serving in a pretty unique role in the collegiate setting where uh, I'm in charge of all injury prevention uh, at Missouri State University. Um, so we've got 17 sports, you know, a little over 400 student athletes, and we screen all of them a couple times a year. And I sit down with our, our full-time strength staff, our sport coaches, our athletic trainers, and we look at what kind of corrective interventions can we make in our off season to uh, to prevent those injuries. And uh, over the last five years, our injury rates are down about twenty percent uh, since we started that program, and it's been a really nice cost savings for the department. Um, and then I, I combine that with my the the rehab side. I'm the rehab coordinator for the athletic department, where I um, I'm in charge of all of our rehab duties. So. I'm an athletic trainer, but I really operate more more like a physical therapist in a traditional yeah. sense. So um, I don't handle all of our rehabs, but most of our post-surgical athletes, most of our more difficult biomechanical cases, things like that, uh, I handle. Um, I'm not also currently handling strength conditioning right now at Missouri State, but in the last uh, – Eight plus years, I have served as strength coach for men's basketball, women's basketball, and volleyball. So, I, I do have a, an interesting background of this mixture between sports medicine and strength conditioning. Uh, if I had to pick the two, I probably would always say I'm a strength coach first. That's what I really love. I love being in the weight room with guys and 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 getting better. Um, but I also have that rehab side. But my strength conditioning really really comes out in the rehab, and that's one of the things. Right. Uh, when I teach and and, uh, and speak to a lot of other you know physical therapists and sports med people, um, when they come into my training room and see what we're doing, they're a little bit taken back because we're applying traditional periodization models and and uh, uh, and loading principles and things like that in our in our rehab situations. So, um, like I said, I'm a strength coach first, but I apply it to the rehab setting as well. Absolutely. Well, a couple of things I want to pull out of there. I mean, one being you know, what, obviously, ego is probably the biggest 
it's I mean it's a joke, right? I mean people get into the, you know these these peeing matches over yeah. stupid stuff when it comes right. to the deal, right? Take that out of it, you know, and just pure ego and, and ignorance. But where is the gap? I mean, where's the gap you see between most strength coaches, most athletic trainers, and, and you know, where can, can we start to meet more in the middle on things in terms of, like you said, I mean, it's like putting the traditional exercises in and putting traditional periodization models in. You know, not, not every athletic trainer does that, and not every strength coach yeah. realizes that we got to, you know, that we gotta, we got to modify it to, be, to account for the athlete, you know, and, what's, and their rehab. It's a, it's a good question, Coach, and, and I've always said I, I, I really see our athletes on a continuum, right? So we, we, we've got one end's like our really high-end you know, professional athlete, right? The other end's our post-surgical athlete. They can't hardly do anything. And everybody that walks in our doors, whether you're in the weight room or whether you're in the athletic training room, everybody falls on that continuum. And so it's our job as professionals. So you as the strength coach, me as the rehab guy, our job is to figure out where every one of those athletes fits on the continuum. And then it's our goal to take all of them wherever they're at to this guy over here, right? Mm -hmm. the, the high end, that's our job. Um, unfortunately, historically, the rehab side, the sports med side, we're really good over here where uh, we're put people on the tables and maybe we do some really remedial stuff. Strength conditioning guys we love over here where guys can run and jump and plant and cut and do all the fun, cool, sexy stuff. Right. And there's that gap in the middle. And I'm sure you're just like us um, with, with where, you, where you work. We see a lot of those in-between kids, right? The kids that uh, were getting recruited by the big schools, but they right. got injured their senior year. And we got to rehabilitate them to get them where they should go. Or guys that were tweeners, sure. you know? Sure. And so we've got to develop them. So there is a gap there. There's no question. I think... I think there's a lot of things that go into that. The things that come to mind, um, I think on the on the rehab side, the athletic training side, a lot of our sports medicine education programs, I don't think are doing a great job of teaching some basic strength conditioning principles. I mean, when I talk with our athletic training students that rotate through our training room about periodization, that's like a foreign word to them. And I feel like our program's pretty good. Sure. And by, by national standards, we're very good with our pass rates. It's just not something that's emphasized. So understanding periodization models, things like that, um, a lot of sports medicine people aren't getting that. And, and just being able to load them up and understand the basics of a back squat and a clean. And I don't think... I don't think athletic trainers should have to teach Olympic movements and do it at a very high level, but I think we need to at least understand basic principles of all the different points that we're looking for, and unfortunately, that's not being taught on the education side. On the flip side, I think strength conditioning, a lot of strength coaches, unfortunately, get, um, you know, they look at this idea of corrective exercise, and, and we do a lot with the functional movement screen. I think a lot of strength coaches, unfortunately, look at that as, um, oh, that's sort of remedial fluff stuff that we don't need. And the reality is, is if if I can teach somebody to squat, lunge, you know, press and pull a little bit more efficiently, then we don't limit their end goal, their their end athletic potential. Absolutely. Um, and so they need to understand how to regress. And so I just really, I really encourage people when I talk to them, instead of having that gap in the middle, that we get an overlap and we just take everybody's knowledge base. And we encourage our, encourage our strength conditioning guys to understand some basic rehab philosophies and rehab knowledge. And our athletic trainers need to understand some basic strength conditioning knowledge. Um, and then we start to communicate much better and we're on the same playing field. And uh, one of the big reasons I was hired nine, eight years ago here was our strength staff and our athletic training staff did not talk, period. They weren't even, they weren't even picking up the phone. And when they did, it, it, there was mistrust. So then our athletic trainers would say, well, just shut them down because I don't trust what's happening in the weight room. And then that limits the strength coach from getting his job done. And uh, ultimately, I was brought in because I could speak both languages. Sure. And so I think it's a language barrier, too, as much as anything of understanding when you're talking about whatever your periodization model is, what phase you're in, and me understanding what that means, and me understanding how what, I, how what I'm doing fits into that. You know, I think I think just that basic terminology is a big deal as well. So there's a number of things that go into that. I'm sure there's more there. Those are the things that kind of come off the top of my head. Well, I, I couldn't agree more with you. And it kind of look, takes me to my next question was, you know, you, you essentially created a position there, you know, in, in a lot of respects. I mean, you saw a gap. You saw you saw a need for this. Um, maybe they had some foresight when reaching out to you initially. But, you know, you've, it's kind of your positions evolved. 
Yes. You know, one, I want you to talk a little bit about, I, I think personally that that's, that's a missing ingredient in most programs is a rehab uh, corrective exercise specialist that's in the room, it's in the trenches, got their sleeves rolled up, that's right there. It's like when that kid can't squat, okay, go with go there, yeah. and then I'm gonna stay. You know, um, yeah. we're missing that. But then how? You know, also I think there's a, 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 something to be said too for pitching yourself and your skill set to your athletic directors, to the powers that be, to create these spots so that when there is turnover and there is things, you can go in. So talk a little bit about the the need for that type of position, and then what you know how you went about pitching kind of this, this radical kind of position? Well, um, yeah, I think, I think those are great questions and, and I'm not sure I have all the great answers, but I will tell you, um, it is a definitely needed position. Um, I think to a large degree, we under evaluate our athletes. And when I say that, I mean, uh, we all know that testing somebody's 40 and their vertical jump are all important in our, in our strength conditioning programs, right? Those are things that we just put in because we know it's important. Our coaches want to see it. Um, but I think we under evaluate the quality of movement, um, basic fundamental stability, movement patterns, things like that. Um, so having somebody just able to spend the time, uh, I know we, we hired, uh, an assistant here a couple of years ago and she came in and she, uh, she really loved this idea of corrective exercise, but the institution she was at before, she's like, I don't have time to evaluate all my athletes in all those different areas and run a strength program and teach this and do that. And so she goes, unfortunately, it's just kind of falling by the wayside. And so I said, well, look, we're an advantage where I can take the evaluation piece off of your plate as long as I can trust that you're going to help me on the corrective side. And so uh, we've worked really well in that regard um, because we both uh, helped each other out and accented what the other person is trying to get accomplished. Um, you're right as far as the need. And, and unfortunately, you look at um, you know a lot of the college programs um, – you know, it's mid majors, things like that, smaller schools. You got one or two, maybe three strength coaches trying to run a football program with 85 to 100 guys. And so, what happens is you got the developmental guys that need probably the most work and the most development and the most time and attention. And what do we typically do? Hey, I'm going to send you with my GA. Right. As you as the head guy, I feel like you need to be with your stars, right? You need to be with your starters, making sure they're getting all the attention. The reality is, those developmental guys, those young guys, probably need your attention more than the juniors and seniors that have been in your program two or three sure. or four years. So to have a guy that that you do that that's been in the trenches and 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 can help with that, I think is really important. And uh, like I said, it's really bared a lot of fruit for us. Uh, mm -hmm. We'd like to think, I'd like to think that it translates into to wins a little bit more than it does at times. Sure. Um, but it definitely translates into our guys being on the field every single week and, and, uh, and which I think eventually translates into wins. Um, how this pro, you know, how this position evolved. I mean, I was incredibly blessed at, at the time I got hired. Um, our medical director, Dr. Brian Mahaffey was a good friend of mine. I was working for him at a local hospital. He recognized my skill set, and he's the one who really pitched it to the, the athletic department here and said, I think this is a missing piece. And, um, of course, a lot of unique things come out of necessity, right? right? And at the time, I mean, we had a basketball, women's basketball program that had multiple femoral stress fractures and a couple of ACLs, and the thing was falling apart at the seams. And uh, our athletic department, uh, before I got here, was just looking, what can we do? What, what, there's got to be something here because our injury rates are through the roof. And they said, well, let's try, try to take an alternative plan here and try something different. And so... Um, with that being said, I mean, I, I'm, I, I put myself in a good position here because, quite honestly, I've just proven the necessity here. Um, but sometimes I also wonder, because college athletics are what they are, you know, if, if I stepped away and tried to do something different, um, I'm not 100% confident they would replace my position uh, with, with somebody else. And that's just the reality of it. Um, and and uh, as you well know, you just have to make yourself – uh, irreplaceable and um, uh, when when budget cuts come down they start looking at you going well you don't work on a sideline well you're right I don't but here's how I can prove my worth X Y and Z and now I've had to do that a few times and because of it I'm I'm still here so right well I think one of the things you said earlier on about you know you, you gave I think 20 percent reduction in, in rates or you know whatever the, the number was but you know being able to, to 
to have a quantifiable number and then be able to apply that to some dollars and cents. Well, we, we in fact, in fact, we did that uh, yeah. about two years ago because there are some things being put in question with all the budgets coming down from the state schools. Uh, we could show our injury rates were down twenty percent, but then we actually put those numbers a dollar and cents, and uh, it's about three hundred fifty-five thousand dollars in medical savings every year wow. um, with those injury rates going down. And uh, I don't know about you, man, but I'm not making three hundred fifty-five thousand no. dollars a year here, so uh, <laughs> so I've that's proven that's my worth. Well, that's so, it. I mean, that's a way for, you know, I mean, young coaches or young athletic trainers to, fi- to, to be able to kind of find a, I think so much right now when we're chasing these jobs, it's, it's, we're still, we're trying to, to fit that, you know, that, that, uh, that square peg into that round hole sometimes. There's only so many jobs and, and it's kind of a set deal, but we've lost the innovative part of, you know, finding and creating, you know, this, this, I mean, this, our profession, training and conditioning is, was created from, uh, a, you know, a mindset that lifting weights was bad for you, and all of a sudden now you got people making three, four hundred thousand dollars a year doing it. You know, and so, you know, getting a strength coach in every high school, creating these assistant athletic director spots in charge of sports performance and corrective exercise specialist, and you know these these spots. I mean, there's there's some opportunity there for coaches. And you mentioned the FMS. You know, is there you know what what Talk a little bit about kind of your day and how you kind of divide that up amongst, you know, being working with the guys in the weight room and then being in the clinical setting. But also what are some of the, you know, FMS, other certifications, that maybe the SFMA or something along those lines that you're using to kind of to screen those athletes? Yeah. So my typical day, um, typical day, uh, I come to the office about 830 in the morning um, and then we're uh, – we're doing one-on-one rehabs. Um, I'm doing one-on-one rehabs till about two o'clock usually, and uh, with just various injured athletes from any sport. Um, and then uh, uh, at two o'clock, most of my athletes are at practice, so that's why we try to cram all of our rehabs in, in the morning. And then, um, depending upon kind of what the time of year is, uh, so for the last few weeks, things have been pretty slow for me in the afternoon. Uh, because just so many of our sports are in season. Um, but that's my opportunity to, to skip out to a practice and, and catch what's going on out there, or maybe peek in on a weight room session and, and, and observe and help out as much as I can. And uh, For me, I used to really try to get in the weight room and, um, and kind of, I don't want to say coach our coaches, but point things out and say, hey, I think you need to look at this. And uh, we've evolved now to the point where our strength conditioning staff is really on the same page with us and our communication is really well, really good. So I don't have that need as much as I used to. Sure. So now a lot of times it's as much about me just popping my head in and, and just catching up on a few athletes and saying, hey, here's how it's going. And our guys pop their head into us as well in the mornings when, when we're around so we can touch base. Um, but then, um, you know, month of, second half of November and the first half of December – all of our fall sports are finishing up, so virtually every afternoon we'll start looking at our, uh, we'll start doing our injury screens on all of our athletes because uh, we'll screen them right out of season. Right. So that way we have all of our data, and then like our football guys, for example, they'll finish middle of November. We'll immediately screen all of them, and then I'll turn all that information over, and uh, so our guys can start putting their their programs together over Christmas break, and then we'll roll into January and February with all that information that we have on our injury screens. Um, so uh, we're very busy those times of year, and and then of course you mix in their meetings with with coaches to discuss what's going on and, and sure. helping guys out if they have questions. And you know we got a lot of young guys, young strength conditioning guys who don't always understand the the terminology and the methodology. So sit, I try to sit down with them and provide them resources. Um, so that's kind of my my day overall. Um, you know, the advantage of my position is I'm pretty much a Monday through Friday guy. I don't travel. Uh, I do occasionally if I want to, but I don't typically travel a whole lot. So my hours are pretty well set, which is great. Um, we do use the FMS a lot, of, um, although it's really just one component of our, uh, of our injury screen. So I look at our injury screen process as I wanted something that looked at the biomechanics, the way our athletes were built, then something that was slow and controlled. And then also something a little bit more dynamic. So we do a lumbopelvic evaluation, which is uh, looking at the hips and leg length. How can we make sure that there's not something going on there predisposes our guys to an ankle sprain or uh, an ACL tear or something like that because one leg's longer than the other or low back pain. We do a foot biomechanical evaluation to look at foot mechanics, 
should we put them in orthotic to keep them healthy? Is there something going on at the foot that we can prevent something else? Uh, that's our kind of how our guys are made. And then we look at the uh, FMS as kind of our controlled environment. We're looking at seven movements, nice and controlled. And then we do a hop and stop test, which looks at single leg power and single leg deceleration. It's kind of more of our dynamic ballistic movement. Um, and so that w that's all the information we do in our screening. Um, uh, you know, other certifications. I mean, if you're going to work in a clin clinical setting, more like I am for the rehab side, I def I'm definitely a big fan of the SFMA. Um, and then any kind of uh, soft tissue work like a Grafson technique I think is really pivotal in this uh, day and age uh, for doing soft tissue work. Um, I, uh, I teach for rock tape, so I'm a big fan of rock tape and some of the things that they're preaching with their fascial movement stuff. Um, uh, you know, on the strength conditioning side, um, you know, you always have to have your standards, um, you know, the basic, the CSCS or CSCCA right. and, and those qualifications. Um, and then anything that I'm looking at quality of movement, I think that's where a lot of, um, a lot of strength coaches, I'd like to see them spend a little more of the time. And that may be FMS, that may be, um, some of the other, you know, I know NSM has some corrective exercise stuff that is pretty good and some different guys that are out there to, to follow. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think those are a good place to start and, uh, and, and really just, constantly learning. I mean, that's the big deal, right? Is just constantly being hungry and researching. And, and I also tell you this, I mean, certifications are great and all. Um, but one of the biggest favors that the first guy who ever hired me out of graduate school did is, uh, I was working at a hospital sports perform hospital based sports performance facility. And he called me the very first day and he said, look, I'm never going to tell you what to do. Uh, you do whatever you want with our athletes. Just don't screw up. And as a 23-year-old kid, I was like, well, I mean, I was kind of scared. I was intimidated. Right. But the reality was what he told me, what he was trying to tell me was, I want you to go play. I want you to experiment. I want you to try new things. Of course, don't kill anybody. Right. But, um, but we only learn by exploring. Absolutely. And uh, so when I go out and work with students or I teach other professionals, things like that, um, I always just tell them, like, look, you're you're getting the the one out of a hundred things that worked really well for me, and there's 99 that didn't. Right. And uh, I just I want other people to to experience those 99. I think that's how we get better as a staff, and that's how we just discover new things overall in strength conditioning and athletic training. So I just encourage people to just play all the time. Well, uh, you know, and what you learned at 23 maybe didn't make sense until you were 40, you know, 42, <laughs> sure. you know. Yeah, he's and, exactly right. You know, that's that's what I'm finding anymore is going back well, to things that I'd learned but didn't have the right perspective, the right paradigm. Yeah. I, I, I'll say too this that um I kind of go a few rounds every now and then when we hire new staff here because, uh, you know, the emphasis always here is, well, we want to hire guys that have uh, Division One experience and they've been through the college strength conditioning setting. And I think that is important um, and it's it's warranted because – I had a big transition when I came over from a hospital-based setting to being here at the university, and I really had to relearn a few things. With that being said, one of the advantages that working in a private setting did for me was I had to work one-on-one -on -one very, very well with people. And if I didn't, we didn't get paid. I didn't have a job. Right. And so um, what I was able to do when I bring, brought that to the college setting was – um, not only be able to run a weight room that's got 35 or 40 guys in it, but also be able to work one-on-one -on -one and break them down and evaluate them. So I think on the strength conditioning side, especially if you've always worked in team sports, that's the other thing I really encourage a lot of our young guys do, to do is to get out and try some, some maybe some internships in the area and community with, with some of these private sports performance facilities. So they just get used to being one-on-one. -on -one, and then I think you can apply that really well to a team setting. Right. But I think if you've always just had 30 or 40 or 50 guys in a weight room, sometimes those individuals get lost because you're so, um, you're so really hell bent on making sure we're getting sets and reps done and the intensity is where we want it and our recovery rates are where they want to be. And we got to rule the room and keep the, uh, excitement high that we we forget a few of those things. So yeah. that's that's just kind of another piece of advice I think really paid off for me when I was younger. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, that was a, the best part about you know having to do all those internships was having to, it was personal training and then trying out everything I was learning simultaneously. And uh, right. I couldn't agree right. more with you. I want to switch gears a little bit. You know, one of the things you know that I wrote about in my book and just talk about often on the show is 
you know, being, you know, kind of three things, you know, being a technician, which obviously we've talked quite a bit about. Yeah. But the second two things are, are, are is being a manager. I mean, you're managing over 400 plus athletes. You're managing, you know, your staff. You're managing your, your family. All these outside, you know, uh, factors. But then also being an entrepreneur. I mean, you, you said you teach for Rock Tape. I know you teach. You've taught for uh, uh, Ultimate Sandbag, and you have, you know, you have your own business. Yeah. Um, you know, and and you got the foundation. You know, so you got a lot of these things going on. Yeah. Talk a little bit about balancing all those things and, and kind of, you know, how, you know, how do you, how are you able to do it and, and not have people worry about your, your loyalties or your attention being divided? Um, I think it's a great question. And, and, uh, that's, that's why I like, well, to I get asked this, it all the time. Like so. you, right. Because, uh, we're all trying to do the same thing. And, and, uh, I think, you know, like you said off the start, one of the reasons why I think you and I hit it off, even though we don't get the chance to talk as much as we like, is because we're sort of one and the same, and we're trying to do a whole bunch of different things and be really good at all of them. Right. And uh, we fall short, and uh, I'm certainly, uh, I know I fall short in some areas. And uh, um, managing all that is is difficult. I mean, most of it comes to time management. And uh, I think time management and a commitment to excellence. And... Uh, I, uh, you know, one of my good friends who we work a lot with Man Up and Go together, we talk all the time, it's just, you know, we win. We win in everything we do. Right. And uh, if we're going to put our stamp on it, we're, we're, uh, um, we're going to do it to the best of our ability and we're going to make it work. And uh, that doesn't mean that you always just shove a, a square peg in a round hole and sometimes you get halfway down a path and you go, wait a second, we're not doing the right thing. You step, you take a step back. Right. Because uh, you have to do that, but you know, time management I think is just so crucial in our day and age. And um, you know, like I said, I'm I'm not as good as I, as I'd like to be. But you know, you're right. I'm 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 managing our stuff here at the university. I've got you know, I take full advantage of uh, my my students. You know, and just like you've got a great intern program, we've got great athletic training students, and I take advantage of them and I use them and I empower them. Sure. And uh, obviously, I don't put them in positions where they're going to uh, fail miserably, but I challenge them, allow them a lot of uh, leeway, and I think that allows me to get a lot more done. Absolutely. Um, and then you just have to rely on other people around you. You know, being an entrepreneur, um, I, I never, for a long time, I never really thought of myself that way, but more and more, the older I get, the more I have that mentality. And uh, uh, for me, one of my recent things is what am I leaving for, for my kids? And, uh, I, uh, and, and not just talking about money, but what is the legacy that I'm leaving them and, and, uh, working in the collegiate strength conditioning or athletic training. It's not like I'm going to be able to hand them a business and, you right. know, a, an insurance business and say, this is yours to take, you know, like a lot of people do. Um, but I still want to build a legacy and, uh, give them resources. And so, um, plus for me too, uh, I, I, I've i always said one of my downfalls is I actually like to do some, too many things. I mean, I love to play golf, but quite honestly, I'm not that good at it. It's really expensive, and it takes too much time. So right. i got to cut that away. I just right. I can't do it, and that's that time management piece. Um, but, you know, I, I teach for Rock Tape. I, I teach for TRX, Ultimate Sandbag, a couple other companies. Uh, they've been um, kind enough to, to let me go out and speak and talk and do what I do. And I love it. I enjoy it. The travel gets old, but, um, um, but for me, my goal with that side of things right now is just kind of making my name, a name for myself. And, right. you know, much like you've done over the last, you know, six or eight or 10 years to, of getting out there and putting information out and trying to create that name, um, which ultimately gives us more stability. And I think that's kind of generally what I'm sort of looking for is, um, who knows what may happen. So if I diversify myself a little bit, uh, don't put all my eggs in one basket. I'm able to, to give myself and my family more stability and hopefully something to, to fall back on somewhere down the road. But, um, you know, time management, commitment to excellence. I probably don't sleep as much as I should. Um, <laughs> I know I don't see my kids as much as I should, which is always tough. Right. Uh, although I'm saying that to you, and I see my kids more than you do, um, but uh, there's always that hunger for a little more of that. No uh, and then I think sometimes you just got to relax a little bit and let it go. Um, you know, and like you mentioned, I'm a, I'm a, I do consider myself a man of faith, and I, I try to, you know, take some time off every week. And yesterday I had a whole bunch of work I needed to get done, um, but my son. 
Uh, he's seven. He's playing basketball, and I, I told him, "Hey, I think we need to sit down." He never watched the movie Hoosiers. It's just like my favorite movie of all time. Awesome. I said, "Hey, dude, we're going to sit down and watch Hoosiers together." And uh, on a Sunday afternoon, I actually went into it thinking, "He's going to sit on the couch. I'm going to sit on the couch. We're going to start watching it." He may get a little bored. I'll work on my computer a little bit, get caught up on some things. Well, he was riveted, and so I said, you know what? Computer can wait, okay. and uh, we sat and enjoyed that time together, and I actually was refreshed and got a whole lot more work done last night after he went to bed than, uh, than, awesome. um, than I would have otherwise. So I think, I think you also have to be willing to step away, and I'm learning that more and more as I get older. I used to go every day from seven in the morning and work on my computer till eleven or midnight. And now I, I'm I'm learning that if I step away, I actually work a lot harder uh, when I when I'm in it. So um, I, I think that's just kind of another piece of advice you throw in there with all the different hats I'm I'm, I'm juggling. So, well, yeah, I, I could agree more, and it's a very similar stories. That's why we, we we connect in so many ways. But you know, I, I, one thing, two things I pulled out of there. One was the you know the committed to excellence. I mean, or, you know, you just I think that's something that, you know, I, I'm the same way. It's like, you know, uh, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to spend time doing it. I'm going to be one, of, I'm going to be one of the best at it. And that's the, story, right. the approach I take. And, you know, if you come across failures or, or pivots as you go right. through, it's just like, man, that's just part of the process. Yeah. You know I mean? It's not the end game, you know, but not yeah. by any means. The problem is, is that you're, you're right. I mean, you, you take on this and then you take on this and you take on this and, and that becomes a challenge, I think, you know. Well, and that's why you have to learn to say no. And yeah. uh, I'm horrible at that. Me Don't too. Me. Like I, me sitting here telling people to say no is the pot calling the kettle black because um, I'm horrible at it. I'm right. getting better as I get older because I just realize I can't, I can't do it all and do it all with excellence. And uh, I really, I really want when when people see my name on something, I want them to go. You know what? That's going to be good. Whatever it is, whatever he's doing, it's going to be something I want to be a part of because it's high quality, and uh, and so I think you have to go into it with that mindset. If you if you don't, then it's a waste of your time. It's a waste of other people's time. You you might as well you know go do something else. Um, but yeah, you have to have that constant over and over again that constant dedication to we're going to do this thing the right way. Um, you know when. Shoot, eight, nine years ago, well, I guess it was seven or eight years ago, Missouri State, we were in a pinch, and they came to me and said, hey, we want you to take over strength conditioning for men's and women's basketball. And I said, well, you know, I have all these other duties, right? And they're like, right. yeah, but they were kind of on this old school mentality. Well, it's just like three hours a week right? because they have three lifts a week. I mean, and I said, no, 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 no. If I'm going to do this, right. I'm going to be at every game, warming every guys up, cooling them down. I'm going to be in the locker rooms. I'm going to be, we're going to separate our workouts out so I can take care of everybody's needs as much as I can. And, you know, I went home to my wife and said, we need to understand if I'm going to do this as a big commitment because I'm not just going to put myself onto something that's, right. that's only done halfway. And, uh, I think if if people are watching this, I hope they take that that away. That just everything you do, you got to go uh, go as hard as you can, as well as you can, and and then don't be afraid when you see something you know you're not going to be able to dedicate enough time to to do it in excellence. That's where you know that that's when you can say no. Hey, I need to step back and say this isn't right for me. Yeah, I think I think the other thing you said in there was you know um not putting all your eggs in one basket you know and and, and it haven't been fired or you know yeah. like, you know it's one of, it's not a it's not a career of if it's when yeah. you know making sure that you have a diversified kind of portfolio and how you you know and a way to to support your family and um and that you know until you've kind of gone through it you don't really understand it you know and that's that's something that you know wisdom and experience can only teach you sometimes but you know, you have to, there's too many people, there's as many people getting out of the profession as there is people getting into it, it seems like. And the way, that, the reason why I do things the way I do it is because I want to find ways to keep me in the profession, you know. And if so, if somebody comes in, and, I, and the other part of that, I'll add to that, is I want to do it on my own terms. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to compromise my values. I don't want to compromise my, my morals. I don't want to, you know, I don't, if I, you know. If I want to be able to come and go, I want to be able to come and go, or whatever it is, um, I want to be able to do it on my terms. And um, I think that's been big. I think with even entrepreneurial things, sometimes that can be looked at negatively. Um, but I'll tell you one thing, by doing that kind of stuff and, 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 and exploring that self, I've become a much better strength coach. But I've also, what I've found even a lot recently is it's inspiring to our athletes. I mean, my, you know, I, I put out this book, and I, and I honestly, I mean, when I wrote this book, I thought five people would buy it. My mom, 
my sister, you know, my wife, maybe, you know, and, and, uh, thought there'd be like five people by it and, and it's done really, really well. And, and because it's done well, um, a lot of the athletes, I mean, I, all of a sudden I, an athlete come in, but I like, I, I bought your book. I'm reading, I'm halfway through it. I'm like, what are you talking? Don't buy my book. Here's, here's, you know, whatever, but, um, it's been inspiring to them. And so that's, that's been cool for me to see that, but you know, that's, that's ultimately what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make it, I, I, mean, I love being a strength and conditioning coach, but ultimately I'm trying to make an impact on young people's lives. And, well, uh, you, you just said something that hits really home for me. And, uh, uh, when I first got hired here, I came in with the attitude that we're going to win ball games, mm-hmm. and that was my job. And as time go- has gone along, what I've learned is uh, this is really part of my ministry, and uh, the opportunity to affect young people and uh, mentor them and shape them, and uh, uh, that's as if not more valuable to me than anything else. No and uh, it's really been a paradigm shift, a change, change in perspective for me on how I approach my job. And I think when you when you start to look at it that way, it actually becomes much more rewarding, right? Absolutely. If what we're trying to do is win ball games, then when you lose a ball game, you're miserable for, for three or four days until you get your head wrapped around what's the next game coming up. And uh, you go crazy. Right. But if, if you put that where it is and that, yes, it's important and that's what we're here to do and that's how, um, that's how we keep our jobs. But if you also put it as, you know, ultimately my job is to, um, is to educate and, and, and bring on young people and bring up, you know, bring up young people, then it's a completely, it's a game changer. Right. And, uh, I know, um, oh, um, his name escapes me. The NFL head coach who used to be with the Colts. Um, Tony Dungy. Tony Dungy, you know, you read some of his books. I mean, I can't remember which one of his books he, he talks about. Uh, there's two different kinds of coaches, and there's transformational coaches and there's transactional coaches. Yep. Trans- transformational coaches, they're able to sit down. They're able to coach their players in a way where they want to play so hard for their coach because they love their coach and they know their coach loves them. And then there's transactional coaches where they, kids just play because – uh, they're afraid what the ramifications are if they don't yeah. play hard. They know they're going to be running or whatever else. Well, I always want to be that transformational guy. I mean, I want I want my guys to play so hard for me and work out so hard or do whatever because they know I love them and they, they love me and we want to get this accomplished together. And, um, you know, kind of back to the piece of, of stability and providing. And, and one of the things that I love about your book, and I think um, – I'm not, you know, I'm not smart enough to, to put the book together like you did. But when I when I opened it up and cracked it open, I thought this is been, this is a book that really was needed for a long time, and I don't think people really realized it was needed. And you're filling a gap, and I, and I'm not saying that just because we're friends and we're on here together. Uh, I'm saying that because I really truly believe, and I think um, a lot of us in the strength conditioning world have sort of been bred that we're kind of stuck in this team sport model or whatever else, right. and. You just come to work every day and you do your job and you go home. Um, but the, the reality is, there's a lot more out there for us if we take advantage of it. Absolutely. But it's not going to come easy, and you got to go out and you got to put in the time and the effort. And uh, I mean, I, I know how much work it takes for you to put things like this together and uh, put them out and uh, and have people want to come watch and listen. And um, it comes. It's a lot of effort, but at the end. To be able to do things on your terms, like you said, is is really really cool and. Uh, I know for me, uh, with a lot of my you know work outside the university, I'm able to say, look, as part of my teaching of your product or your company or whatever it is that I'm representing that day, I also want to talk about my kids and, and how much I love adoption and how important that is to our family and my Man Up and Go ministry and how I do this and this and this. And if you're not okay with that, then maybe I need to go teach for somebody else. But right. if you are, then great, we're going to do this together. And what's cool is every time I do that, just last week I was in New York City talking about some of the stuff that's outside of the strength conditioning athletic training world. And I had a guy from Poland who was in the course come up to me afterwards and just thank me because he wanted, he felt like what we were doing was so necessary outside of, of, uh, of what the topic of the course was. And Absolutely. So, that's but, that's where it's pretty cool for me, you know. Yeah, it's, that's what it's all about, and you know, you don't, you know, you, you don't get caught up in what logos on your chest. You get you get yeah. caught up in, in the impacts that you make. But it's a great segue into you know into the last question I wanted to talk to you about, and just not so much a question as just a 
you know, this is the last episode of the year. And, it, uh, you know, and, and in my last episode every year, I've tried to, to find um, a, an organization that is making an impact in the world in some way and really highlight it, man. And, and what you got going on with Man Up and Go is, is phenomenal. So just for everybody, listen, you know, um, tell us a little bit about it. One thing I left out early on, and one of the other things that, that kind of connects us is that you're an adoptive parent as well, you know, and part of the reason why we're shooting this early is because um, you're, you're, you're going for one or two? Uh, just a little girl. This, little this girl. will be number four for us. Four, this is number four. That's right. Yeah. Four, four uh, overall, and then, uh, I thought, yeah. I, I couldn't remember if you were adopting one or two at this time. Yeah. This just, is number four. Yeah. Yep. So we're in the same boat, four adopted kids and, and – um, you know, it's just, I mean, it's awesome. And you know that, but talk, talk about man up and go and how people can get involved. So, um, man up and go is, is, uh, we're obviously a Christian based nonprofit organization. Um, our, we really have two things that we're looking for. We want lo less orphans in the world and we want more families. And, uh, this thing origin originated back in 2011, sort of, uh, just a good friend of mine. He, he was adopting a little girl from Ethiopia and when he got over there to pick her up, he, he noticed that when he walks into the orphanage, the kids just flock to him as a man. And his wife was sort of secondary at that point. So we started looking around going, you know, holy cow, uh, these kids need a father figure. He's looking around and seeing all the caretakers are women. And, uh, and if they have a man that they've been associated with in their life, it's probably associated with uh, violence or sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, these kids were hungry for the love of a father. So he came back and was like, you know, hey, do you think we can get 10 or 12 guys uh, to go over to Ethiopia and Uganda for a couple weeks and just play with kids? And naturally I was in because we, uh, we had two adopted kids at that point working on a third adoption. And I said, sure, I'm in, let's go. Well, we ended up having um, 42 people on that team, I believe. I think 28 of them were men. And international missions uh, teams for almost for, for most organizations are about 95% made up of women and it's really hard to get men and, and uh, quite honestly we, we all know the excuses we I've made them myself of you know I don't have enough time I can't leave my family I can't take the vacation time blah 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 uh, the reality is you and I aren't that important um, right. at home we can take a step away for a couple of weeks and go do something neat um, so we had a lot more people than we thought. We ended up bringing a film crew of five people with us, film a full-length 90-minute documentary that's won awards all over the world out of this trip. So anyway, long story short, we, we, we come back from this trip, and we go, ah, that was fun. Let's do it again next year. So we did it the next year, and then we did it the year after that. And fast forward now, we've had, um, I think, 15 teams now travel around the world, uh, Uganda, Ethiopia, Nicaragua. I'm leading a team in March to... Uh, uh, Dominican Republic. We've just launched a domestic program here, both in Springfield, Missouri, and in Clearwater, Florida. Um, but through all this process, we never really set out to have this nonprofit or this foundation. We just wanted to go play with kids. Right. And in the meantime, what we've learned is a lot of the issues that are going around the world uh, around us it really come down to what we see as a breakdown of the traditional family unit, which ultimately comes back to men behaving badly and not living up to our duties as husbands and fathers and leaders in our communities and our homes. And so um, we want to impact orphans and we, we participate in what we call com traditional compassion programs um, like um, feeding programs, schooling, vocational training, things like that. But ultimately our goal is to get at the men. And so we host uh, two-day men's conferences um, like I said, we, we launched this domestic program where we can mentor men in our own community and get them active and involved. Um, we've got a, a, a longer term men's empowerment program we piloted in Uganda that's uh, getting, a, um, we've learned a lot and we're getting ready to launch 2.0. And so our goal is to just inspire men to, to be leaders and get off the sidelines, to be leaders in their homes and their communities. And, um, because of it, I'm a better father. I'm a better husband. I'm a better, uh, um, you know, leader here in Springfield. And, and so we're just always encouraging people to want to get involved. Um, and uh, we want people to join our teams, uh, our mission teams. We've got five or six scheduled for 2016. Uh, so we always want people to join our teams. And number one, it's a great opportunity to go serve and uh, be a part of something that's bigger than us. 
Um, but it also changes you when you step into a third world country and suddenly my iPhone doesn't work and, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I may or may not have hot water for a couple of weeks and this, it, it really, it changes your perspective on life and what's important and, uh, what's, uh, um, you know, and so you come home just changed because you've got this really deep immersed experience for a week or two weeks or whatever it is. And once you come back, then you're better at your job and everything else. So uh, we love to have people involved. If, you know, we also recognize some people can't go to Africa for two weeks. I get it. And that's why we've launched this domestic program that we're piloting. But uh, uh, our website's manupandgo.org. And uh, you can order the documentary on there. We've got some gear. You can check that out. You can just see what, who we are, what our missions are. We've got some amazing partners that we're working with around the world um, and some big projects. So. I'm, I'm so, I mean, they can join teams. The conferences, are they the, are local or is that part of the trip? That's part of the trips. Okay. So, like the last three years, we've set up uh, men's conferences throughout the country of Uganda. So, we roll into Uganda and we partner with uh, local churches and local pastors in uh, three different locations. And we just set up shop and we'll have anywhere from uh, 150 men at a conference to, we had uh, just shy of 400 at one of our conferences uh, this last year. Wow. And so we just teach, you know, biblical principles of uh, general leadership, um, money and finance and marriage and family and, uh, and just trying to get guys inspired and, and, um, we teach it in a way that's, uh, I think, I think people get intimidated. A lot of guys get intimidated when you say, Hey, we want you to go teach, uh, especially, um, about biblical manhood. They kind of go, Whoa, Whoa, wait, I don't know if I'm ready for this. Um, cause I, I've been in that boat, I sure. can tell you that. Um, but, um, we put all the curriculum together ahead of time. And so our guys know exactly what they're walking into. And a lot of times it just turns into us sitting in front of other guys talking about um, our experiences and how we handle just doing what you and I are doing right now. And Hey, how do you handle your family? How do you handle your work? And, and um, they become really awesome, fun opportunities to get together. And, and uh, what you find is our cultures are different um, and our resources are different, but you know, ultimately we're all human beings and we're all men and we're all trying to do the same thing and provide for our families and, and, um, and do, uh, you know, and work and have a successful career. And, uh, we may have a little different way of accomplishing it, but we have a lot to contribute to each other. So. Absolutely. I'm assuming that, um, if you can't go, then I'm assuming there you're on the website, there's a place for donations, things like that. Absolutely. Oh yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we're, we're still a young organization. We really just, uh, a little over a year ago, became a 501c3. So we're, resources are always thin. So uh, if somebody's just looking for a great cause, especially as we come up on the year, uh, end of year giving opportunities, um, there's definitely uh, donation opportunities on the websites. And, um, and, you know, feel free to just reach out to us and contact us as well, um, just if you're interested in learning more. I mean, we want to talk to people. We want to engage people. Um, it's, it's not... You know, for us, the end game is just getting the message out. And right. so um, even if people have an opportunity, they say, hey, we'd love for you to come speak to our local group or our local church. I mean, that gets a little difficult if you're telling me up in Detroit that you've got a, a church I can come speak to and how we handle the travel. But we put that on the list, and maybe we've got somebody in the area that's one of our guys that can come talk, or maybe sure. we'll make that work. But we, we just want to get the word out and get the message out, and I think uh, – um, you know, 163 million orphans around the world right now. And, uh, you know, it's interesting and, and, you know, we're coaches, so we like stats, right? And so, you know, you look at the U S some stats really speak to me. I mean, um, I think around 90% of the people in the U S prison system are men and 85% of those come from fatherless homes. Yeah. And so you look at our prison system, I mean, 85% of those guys don't have a father in their home. And, and one-third of U.S. kids today go to bed without uh, their biological father in their life. And uh, that's pretty tough, you know, for a lot of those kids. And, and what we look at, the reason why we want to go after men, um, I'll give you one last stat, um, is, and it's really related to churches, but I think it correlates to a lot of other things. But uh, research has said when, when a kid starts going to church for the first time, um, I think the number is somewhere around 5 or 6% of the time the family follows. When a mom goes to, starts going to church, 
um, that number jumps to like 17 or 18 percent of the time the rest of the family follows and goes to church consistently. When the man, when the father in the home decides to go to church, 92% of the time the family follows. Wow. And so you look at it for us to make an impact on men, and whether that's a biblical model or not, depending on what people's face are, it doesn't matter. As men, we, we've got a further reach, and we, we, there's, there's something about just the way we were made and our leadership qualities and things like that. And I'm not saying that to, to downplay women or anything like that, because trust me, my wife is smarter than I am. I right. guarantee that. Right. Quite honestly, she makes more money than I do. And so by, by worldly standards, she's more successful than me. But there's something about us as men that we have a further reach. Um, and so if we can impact men, I think we can make a, a significantly in, uh, larger impact, not to keep using the same word, right. but um, exponentially uh, throughout the world. So that's really what, what we're trying to do. Well, it's impactful because as men, we've we've not lived up to the standards, yeah. you know, obviously, you know, and that's uh, that's the thing. I, I tell the story all the time, you know, um, that there was three times in my adult life that I've cried, you know, and one was my, my father, my my uh, my brother was murdered, and one was walking off the field, you know, from my last game, and, and the third was we were leaving the the orphanage and. You had a hundred plus kids coming up and grabbing at us, saying "Mama and Papa," you know, and it broke my heart, man. You know, and uh, and so this is a this is an a awesome organization. Um, couldn't agree more, and and you know, and donate. And like I said, I mean, not everybody, especially with strength coaches, it's hard to yeah. get away. But find a way to get involved. If not this organization, find one that you you can, because you always, in my entire life, it's always come back tenfold. You know, not just money, not just money, but in experiences yep. um, and going to another world, uh, third world country by far is something you have to do in your life. So you start to think globally as opposed to just domestically um, being around uh, children that, you know, um, just have so much love and joy and, 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 and just want safety. You know, they just want to feel safe. You know, and have basic needs met. You know, and this and this show goes out to to six thousand plus coaches. And I always say, you know, there's been a handful of times that I've done this, but if just every person gave one dollar, that'd be six thousand dollars. They'd make a big impact in, in make a huge impact. You know what you're doing. So I'm gonna make sure to link that up. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, I'd encourage everybody to go check it out. But man, uh, you're an inspiration, brother. You really are. And, well, and, and back uh, at you. You know, it's pretty cool just to see. I think what you said earlier with the, with um, as, as as strength coaches. You know, I think in strength coaches that's general, we're all kind of wired the same. Um, you know, ninety nine point nine percent of us, um, it's in our DNA to win at things, to 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 take on multiple tasks, to make an impact on young people's lives. Um, we all have that in us, and 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 so you found a way. My wife and I have found a way with adoption game plan. Um, so to love, make, to love leave love. our footprint, and you talked about legacy early on, about leaving a legacy to your children. There's not a better legacy than making this world a better place than you found it, somehow, some way. And I know you're doing that. So, man, I appreciate it, brother. Hey, I do too, I do too man. And I, uh, you know, that legacy piece I think is important. The older I get, the more I want to make sure that uh, – Someday when, when I'm not around and my kids are, are proud of what daddy accomplished. And uh, I know your, your kids are going to look at you that way and uh, um, be pretty proud of, of what you've done in this world. And, and I think that's kind of another litmus test, you know, when uh, uh, you start asking yourself, what should I be involved in? And, you know, someday are, are my closest people, my kids or my, my parents or whatever, if, if I'm not around, are they going to be proud of, of who I am and what I accomplished? And if I can say that every single night, then uh, I'm doing something right. That's absolutely right, man. I appreciate it, buddy. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you, man. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out ronmckeefree.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefree's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefree in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefree can be found on Twitter at rmckeefree. 
on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash Ron dot McKeefery. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk.